Thanks for coming out. I'm uh, Joe Robinson. I'm the organizer of Designers and Geeks. Uh, how many here are here for the first time? Wow, nice. That's awesome. This is a huge group. This is a, I don't think we've had an event quite this big, so uh, excited to have you all here. So um, the way we do this is um, you've just experienced the first part. We start out with the pizza and beer, get you all loaded up and ready to go. Um, and the next part is uh, the speaker. So tonight we have Carolina Di Bartolo, uh, and uh, she's going to be talking about topography. So very excited for that. After that, we have a quick segment called Shoutouts, where basically if you have something that you want to network about or something you want to say to the group, you can come up here. I'll give you the microphone for 15 seconds, say your part, and then uh, and just hear what other people have to say. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, and then after that, we have the space for roughly another 45 minutes after the talk. Um, and there's usually an after party at local editions. So um, if you're into that, that happens at 9. Um, so before we get started, just wanted to say thank you to a few folks. Uh, first and foremost, Yelp for providing the space and the, the pizza and stuff. So this is Eric from Yelp. Uh, let's give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Hello, thank you. I won't keep it very long. My name is uh, Eric Singley. I head up the uh, product team here at Yelp. Uh, Yelp is hiring. We're hiring product managers and designers. So if you're interested in one of those things, you can come talk to me afterwards or you can email me. I'm just Eric, Eric with a C, Eric at Yelp. Uh, fun place to work and you could get not only a job, but one of these very, very red track jackets if you come to work here. So fun times. Thanks guys for coming. Yelp has been has been great about hosting the group. So love, love having it here, love the space. So thank you to them. Um, so not too much more, let's jump right into it. So uh, very excited for this talk, uh, as are many of you. Um, so let's get started. Welcome, uh, Carolina. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Carolina DeBartolo, and I'm here to talk to you today about why typography matters. Um, uh, the first thing to know about typography that you might not realize is that type is everywhere. You are swimming in a sea of letters, and sometimes you might forget that because you read them, right? You use the functionality, but you forget to see them as form. So type is everywhere. It's everywhere on the street, cars, signs, even in your pocket. Those are the old tokens, right? Like they don't have those anymore. So now you have a little card, but I still love the old subway tokens. Uh, when you're eating, lots of type around you. Uh, your salt and pepper shaker usually even has letters on it, right? Uh, even after you die, usually you are surrounded with type. <laughs> There's some very beautiful ones, right? Um, if you have tattoos, then you can never get away from your type, right? If you have like a lettering on your, on your body, you know, that's another one. Uh, also in works of art, right? A lot of times you see lettering of some kind, even in works of art. And of course, books, reading experiences of all kinds, uh, whether it's a regular book or a phone book, you know, anything like that, there's always type all around you that you're using. Uh, the web, also, right? All kinds of type on the web. There's Quora, I should have used Yelp. I should have used Yelp. <laughs> that was an old slide. Um, anyway, so from Quora, it was mainly typography. And one thing to notice, this is um, the uh, wordless web. Has anyone ever heard of that? G. Lee's wordless web. It's like a little, a uh, toolbar plugin you can get to take all the typography off of your page. So it actually looks really weird, right? When you see things that don't have type on them, actually seems like a very strange situation when you when you don't see any type in, in your environment because it's really almost always in your in your field of view somewhere. Uh, also things like this where oh the slide is cut off. Um, this is a another work of art. It's a Mark Twain book that was uh, that redacted everything except for the N-word that's throughout the book as a, as a protest kind of against that. Remember that thing that came up where a library had uh, deleted, gotten the book republished uh, and changed the N-word to the word slave? Uh, however, most of the type that you see looks terrible, <laughs> right? It looks, it's more like that, right? Um, and it's kind of, and sometimes it's overwhelming too. There's too much type. Uh, this is Hong Kong, if anybody's ever been to Hong Kong. <laughs> um, I can't read most of that, but um, the signage is actually over top of the street like that. So it's very, very busy, full of type all the time. Um, always a lot of messages um, coming at you. So what is typography? Some definitions. The visible form of language. Uh, idealized writing, Robert Brinker said that typography is idealized writing. So it came from handwriting um, and it was a standardized way of writing so that people could understand, a, a greater, a bigger audience could understand what the messages were. 
If you write a note to your sweetheart and your handwriting is illegible, well, they forgive you. But if your type is illegible in the newspaper, well, that kind of ruins the whole idea of a democracy, right? <laughs> so um, it's also a durable form of language, right? It lasts, so information can spread more easily over generations, centuries, et cetera, um, and from place to place around the world. Uh, also, another interesting thing about typography is it's equal parts art and craft, right? Um, there's, there's kind of an X factor in typography. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the, the art part, and then there's a lot of conventions in typography, you know, like exactly how to do it is, there's a lot of things that you need to know about doing it well. And what does typography do? My slides are cut off on the top. There's actually, it says, what does typography do at the top? <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't make that strange question. Um, so, <laughs> um, I don't know if we can fix that, though. It's like that. Uh, big letters shout, you might say. Uh, small letters whisper. Serif faces articulate. Grunge fonts mumble and slur. Scripts sing or sans serif speak in very clear business-like tones. Uh, by the way, in case anybody doesn't know, the difference between sans serif and serif type. Anybody not know the difference between serif and sans serif? Top row, serif type, you see it has the little feet at the bottoms of the stroke. Whereas in the middle here, you have no, um, I guess I could use my little pointer. Right there, see, there's no extra stroke at the bottom of the, of the main stroke. That's a sans serif, so sans just means without. Then this one has a little stroke at the bottom of the R, so that's a serif. You also have this one here, and you can see how it's a different kind of a stroke than the top one, right? It's a different shape. So that also defines the different kinds of type that you have. The different shapes of the serifs vary from typeface to typeface. Uh, in other words, <laughs> you know what, can I switch my slides so people can see the type? <clears throat> How do I do that? <laughs> I don't think I wasn't doing that before, I didn't think. Sorry, folks, bear with us for a second. That one's not cut right. I just want to turn to the full screen. It cuts off the top. Yes. Uh, and then go full again. Oh, go the full screen again? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> By the way, does it, oh here's here's a little trivia question. I have some free posters to give away. So by the way, does anyone know who made that piece of typography on the side there? No, that's a good guess though. <coughs> anyone? Somebody? Yes? Who? It's not Picasso. No. No, David Carson. No, we already had a David Carson guess. No, you're, you're in good company, though. You're, you're making good guesses. That's Robert Massin, OK, French guy. He did, that's for La, La Cantor Chiche Show. Uh, OK, so we went over that. And in, in the end, what I want to tell you is that there is meaning inherent in typographic form, OK? So the form of the letters gives meaning to the text. If you can imagine, for example, newspaper headlines said in a script, you know, terrorist attack, you wouldn't do that, right? You wouldn't do that. And even the general public would be up in arms if they saw something like that, right? Because they know that's the wrong way to pr uh, present that message, okay? So type gives text a voice, meaning inherent in the form of the letter. Um, a, a voice or a personality or a face, right? It's called a type face, you know? It's how it looks. Um, type's like an actor cast in a role. Uh, also, you can say type is the link between a writer and a reader. Good typography, how to do typography well. Here's another quiz question. The G, who drew that? Anybody? Recognize? Eric Gill. Eric Gill, yay, that's Gill Sands. Gill Sands G, you can see how geometric it is. Uh, so, principle number two, after type is everywhere, principle number two, good typography is economical, okay? What do I mean by that? also known as don't use a font you don't need. Now, the definition of the word font has changed over time. <laughs> it used to be that all the metal type in one drawer of a type case, right? So when you had metal type in a single drawer, all of that type was the same weight, size, and typeface, right? So a font is one face in one size and one weight. All the metal type in a drawer of a single typeface because the next drawer down is the next size, right? And some other case has all the bold and you know, there's all the Roman. 
So don't use a font you don't need. So don't use a weight you don't need. Don't use a size you don't need, OK? So here's a technique for not using a font that you don't need. Change one variable at a time, OK? If it's larger type, it doesn't have to be bolder type. If it's bolder type, it doesn't necessarily have to be larger type. If it's in a color or if it's in all caps, for example, like a head, it doesn't have to be in a different typeface or it doesn't have to be in a different size or a different weight. So you can simplify, be economical, you know? Uh, those comparisons, <laughs> it's much harder. What, what he's doing on the top was a lot harder, right? It was harder to change size. It was harder to change weight when you were doing it the way on the top. On the bottom, so easy, right? If you're doing this, kind of hard, right? Hard to keep changing size all the time. Hard to keep changing weight all the time, you know? So when it's harder, it was actually simpler. There's a photographer named Lizette Modell. She said, Photography is the easiest art, which perhaps makes it the hardest. In other words, it's become easier to do it poorly. It's the same with typography, right? It's become easier to do it badly because you have so many easy variables to change when you're working on a computer. So principle number three, good typography makes a difference. I'm going to teach you the principles of Vitruvius. <laughs> Everybody knows who made that, right? If I ask, I can ask you an easy trivia question now. Who made that picture? Leonardo. Leonardo. <laughs> I didn't get the right answer. I thought everybody was going to know the right answer. That's Leonardo. That's Leonardo after Vitruvius. But remember, Leonardo's, you know, he's, he's the Renaissance man, right? So this is 1497, something like that, this drawing. However, Vitruvius, look at that date. 75 to 15 BC, okay? Vitruvius was an ancient architect. Three principles of good architecture. Number one, fitness. Is it useful? Do people need it? Okay? Fitness. It, it corresponds today to business. By the way, does anybody know what that is? That picture. What is that thing? That's cuneiform, right? So that was the, uh, one of the old uh, forms of writing marks in clay tablets, and that was used for business, right? People exchange, kept track of what their um, exchanges were. You know, I gave you three goats, and you gave me six sheep, or whatever it was. <laughs> I owe you six sheep. So fitness is number one principle. Second one, firmness. In other words, it's useful. Today corresponds more to technology, the engineering side of things, right? How do you make it? You know, how do you make it functional? And so it's, it's solid. And then this image, what is that? Venetian alphabet, right? So the alphabet was a technology. You know, we tend to forget that. <laughs> um, uh, Don Norman said a pencil was a tech is a technology. But once you get used to it, you forget. You don't call it a technology anymore. We tend to call all technology high technology. But an alphabet was a technology. Before they had the alphabet one letter per sound, you had only writing systems that had one letter per, per word, right? So that was never made into movable type. Or it was in China, but it never caught on, right? Because it's like you have to have too many of that. Those drawers would be huge. <laughs> 10,000 characters per drawer, you know? The third principle is delight, right? So that corresponds to design or desirability. People love it. People care. It's cool, right? You need that. So fitness, firmness, delight. Those are your three principles. You need them all. They will all be existing in different proportions for different designs, for different things that you make, right? So it's not going to be a 33, 33, 33 percentage, you know? Some things are more useful. Some things are more desirable, you know? But you have to decide what do people need? You know, what are people, what's your audience need for each thing that you're designing? I always say, like learning to draw, learning typography is learning to see. You learn to see things that you previously had overlooked. Uh, Charles Eames said, the details are not the details, they make up the whole. Or so I'm paraphrasing something along those lines. <laughs> um, in any case, typography concerns itself with very small details very often. So it's a matter of kind of turning, tuning in on a different channel in your brain and learning to see very small things as being more important than other things. For example, quotation marks. <laughs> There's different kinds. There's what, in the old days, in Quark, they used to call it smart quotes, right? The curly quotes at the top. These ones, whoops, let's see. Those ones, see how this one is shaped like a nine? And this one on the other side, shaped like a six? 
those are called real quotation marks, right? So the, fr the first one is called a six and the last one is called a nine, actually. In typography, we call those sixes and nines. You can also see how it was translated into the sans serif type here. Here's a, uh, a nine, but because it's a sans serif, there's just, it's a little wider at the top and narrower at the bottom. But you can see how it's also kind of curved, right? So real quotation marks have a curvature to them, almost like parentheses around the quoted material. Whereas when you have these at the bottom, which are often mistaken for um, quote marks, those are what they call sometimes straight quotes, but they're really used for inches and feet. You know, those are prime marks, or primes, right, if you were studying a math equation. Uh, other kinds of details, like the difference between text figures and lining figures. So text figures are based on the X height of the type. Let's see if I can point to that. Where's that? Oh. So this letter A is the, the, line, the distance between the uh, blue line here and the blue line there. Um, that's the X height of the type. So you can see how these text figures are based on that X height, and then they have A senders and D senders. Whereas these lining figures on the bottom, they're based on the cap height, the height of the capital letters. We have different kinds because within text type, it looks better to use the top ones, right? When you have paragraphs of text, so that the numbers blend in with the type. Um, whereas when you have to set a math equation, like at the bottom here, then all your numbers are going to line up, you know? Lining figures are also what they call monospaced. So every figure, even whether, whether it's a narrow figure like a one or a wider figure like an eight, has the same space around it. So they're all equally spaced. So when you do a math problem, it will line up. Make sense? Yeah. Details. Also, true caps versus fake small caps. True, true small caps versus fake small caps. You can also see on the top one how the small caps are the same size as the X height again. They blend in with the upper and lower case. Whereas on the bottom, the small caps are the fake ones. It's used like a clicker button in InDesign or something that says, you know, make, make, it, make give me some small caps. <laughs> it's not really designed as part of the typeface. Um, so that one is also not based on the X height. So it doesn't blend in the same way. The other thing you can see on here is the F versus the AKE. The F looks older, right? You see that? The F and the I look a little bit bolder. The stroke is a little bit bolder. That's because it's actually just bigger. It's bigger type, so the, the strokes got proportionately larger. So that's how you can tell that the caps are the fake kind, the wrong kind of small caps. So no, 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 no on all those <laughs> fake stuff. Uh, don't use that. Also, widows. Everybody knows what a widow is, right? One word left on a line by itself like this. Uh, or rivers, that's when you have huge word spaces, you know, when you justify type on a narrow column and you get these great big word spaces. Sometimes people call that white acne. I don't like that term, though. <laughs> Ick. Right? Anyway, but you want this kind of, you know, even color at the bottom. Also, what's called pig bristles sometimes. Not a great name either. I don't know if anybody knows. I was trying to find another name for that one, but everybody calls it pig bristles. When a lot of lines end in punctuation, that one's all ending in hyphens, but you could have periods and commas and other things, so the edge of the type doesn't look very nice. Also, avoid shapes in a ragged edge. Um, this one is what they call a barrel-shaped rag, right? The, the rag makes an arc, but you want to avoid also flat spots. If it's supposed to be ragged, it should look ragged, so you don't want to square it off one, right? You don't want to look justified if it's supposed to be ragged. You also don't want a triangle, like three lines getting progressively longer or three lines getting progressively shorter. So no shapes. They say that a rag should look like a torn sheet of paper, right? It should look random, you know? Also, <laughs> the amount of tracking that you use. Top one, too loose. Middle one, normal, they say. This type is set tight. I actually think for this type here, this, this third one, that's what I would go for. You know why? That's bold. Bold type, tight tracking. Light type, loose tracking, okay? If it's, if it's light type, the reason you're using light type is because you want it to look light. So open up the tracking a little looser, right? If you're using bold type, spacing it out, you're taking black, you know, dark type and opening it up. Why bother, right? You're, 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 not, um, you're at cross purposes there, right? So you want to set bolder type with tighter tracking. Uh, the bottom two are also a little too tight, but even the very tight one is okay for that bold for me. Not too bad. Depends on what you want, okay? But the top one is kind of ridiculous, right? Bold type, loosely tracked, it's kind of opposites. Also, 
Kern, baby, Kern, okay? The space between two letters. So the difference between tracking, previous page, this one, this is the whole body of the text or the whole uh, group of text has added space between the letters or subtracted space between the letters. When you have space just between two particular letters alone, that's called kerning. When you do the kerning, all the good ones are at the bottom here, see? Those are all the good ones. These are all the ones that are messed up. See the I is touching the parentheses. A lot of times around spaces, you need to kern spaces. When you have large display type, like size type like that, the space, when you press space bar, you get too big of a space. So a lot of times you have to kern the space a little smaller. Um, all things like this, when punctuation goes around something, a lot of times punctuation needs kerning. Kern display, track text. So we always add tracking to text type, and then we always kern display type. You know, you have to make custom settings between the letters on large type. Your highest typographic priority, even color. When we say even color, what we mean is like an even texture. The most famed typographers in history were from Gutenberg, Garamond, Baskerville. Who else from history? Who? The Bauhaus wasn't a typographer, though. I was trying to think of people. Who do we know? Caslon. All those old guys, OK? They went down in history because their type was set with even color, not just for their type designs, which were you know, uh, revolutionary, right? They changed the design of the type. But because when they set the type, their type had even color. When they meant for it to be one single paragraph and one group of text, all the text looked like the same texture or color, right? We call that typographic color. Um, however, your color can vary, okay? It doesn't mean it has to be the same shade of gray. If you set bold type, it's going to look darker, and that's okay. And if you want to make a headline or something and it looks darker, that's normal, right, to make hierarchy. But within a single body of text, you want the even color. That's your highest priority. So when I see the uneven color, it makes me very mad, <laughs> okay? Because actually, even color, it can be easy to get. You just have to be aware that that's what you're aiming for. And too often, people are concerning themselves with other things. But that is your highest priority, is even color. So other thing to know about typography, <clears throat> you have two options. And this is not just typography. This is in all of design. In all of design, you have two options, exactly the same or decisively different. Have you seen these kind of things? Like when you're using your type menu, and for some reason, it gives you these options. It says like 12 point, and then 14 point, 16 point, 18 point, like that. Do you ever wonder where those numbers came from? Why? Why do they offer you that? Why don't they give you 47 and 75? <laughs> Any idea? Yeah. Yeah, that's a decisive difference in point size. Okay? That doesn't mean, so if you use 84 point type, in order to make it clearly bigger, you need to use 96. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use 83 point type, but you can use this as a reference, right? So if you have 83 point type, then you gotta go in the 90s somewhere to make a clear difference, you know, around 95 and up, you know? Something like that. Does that make sense? Make a clear difference. Or make it exactly the same size. That's OK, too. Also, if you have many weights in a typeface, this typeface is called Univer. <laughs> Everybody says it a little bit differently, right? Um, some people say universe, but they're not from France when they say that. So Univer, yes, it means universe in French. But he was, who designed Univer? Does anybody know that one? Adrian Frutiger, excellent choice. Adrian Frutiger designed Univer. It was the first type that had 21 weights, and they were numbered instead of named, right? Because it was in this system of Univer 55. Whoop, where is he? Here's Univer 55. That was the Roman, the basic weight, the parent weight. And then 56 was the italic. Then you got narrower and narrower and narrower, and then you got wider over here. And then the weights changed in this direction. Now, of course, they have, all the, they have all these boxes filled in and even more, right? They have many, many more weights, but that's the original from 1957. If you have a typeface that has a lot of weights, and 21 is a lot, usually, in order to make a clear, decisive difference, now this is a difference in weight, not a difference in size, you need to take two steps. So if you're using 55, Univer 55, here, this one isn't a big enough difference. You have to go to 75. Make sense? Take two steps. Same thing in the other direction, right? You need to take two steps sometimes to make a clear enough difference. 
By the way, typographers also come in different weights. <laughs> Who designed that? Frank Lloyd Wright. You guys know your designers tonight. Frank Lloyd Wright said, all design is the design of negative space. So one of the things that you should notice about all the things I've just talked to you about typography, almost all of it is concerning space, right? The space between letters, the space of the, uh, the negative space, the, spa the, 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 rag, the shape that the rag makes, right? You're, you're creating a space, okay? So you need to also look at the space, the space around the letters. In the end, trust your eyes, okay? It is an art, not a science, in the end, okay? So make final decisions based on your eye if it looks right. You know, if it, sometimes things have to be misaligned in order to look aligned, like if you have a drop cap, for example. I don't have any images of that, but I can show you maybe. Legibility is empathy. Making things legible is taking care of your audience, thinking of your audience. What would they like? What can they use, you know? Also, Finally, to know, <laughs> uh, being consistent is more important than knowing all the rules. You know, I teach a lot of these conventions in uh, classes, and what I tell the students is like, while you're here te learning with me, you have to show me that you can understand these principles, these conventions, these typesetting uh, things that we are learning in the class. But after you leave, you can say, F you, Carolina, I'm not doing that, you know? I can make up my own thing, okay? That's okay. But what I always like to say, a lot of teachers say, for example, you have to know the rules before you break them. I prefer to say, you must first embrace the orthodoxy before you can be a heretic. Um, <laughs> so you have to have something to bounce off of. You can't just do it the wrong way to start. So you do need to know these conventions and understand them in order to break them well. You know, uh, Another one that somebody had said is, you, uh, the rules of typography can be broken but never ignored. You know. So you can make up your own system. If you do make up your own system, for example, if you don't know the difference between a hyphen and an n dash and an m dash, well, just use whatever you're going to use and just be consistent about it throughout the whole document, OK? And then people, the readers, will understand. You know? So if you forget the rules, whatever, you can't find it, you're in a rush, just make it consistent. That's the most important thing, OK? However, there's always the x factor, right? There's always that quality that you need in your typography, that delight, you know, the third principle from Vitruvius. The, the quality that, you know, it's kind of indescribable. It's something where somebody sees it and they go, wow, I, that makes me smile, or I really want to own that or get that or see that again, you know? So there's that kind of extra quality. If you came here today, I assume that you might like to be better at your typography. <laughs> and the way to get better is to practice. Uh, there's something called deliberate practice. It's, uh, they sometimes describe it as watching yourself practice. So watch yourself make mistakes. Pay attention. You know, be critical of yourself so that you can move on and do it better the next time. Don't worry. They call it also sometimes they say that fail faster, right? Just keep failing. You know, just keep going. You just have to keep trying you know, many, many, many times. Uh, also, <laughs> mastery attracts because mastery eludes. So don't be scared. You know, you are going to make mistakes. You will fail, quote unquote, fail, right, at your typography as you're learning. Um, but at least maybe it won't be in stone, right? Especially these days, usually digital, you just change it up. You know, make a mistake, just change it up. Uh, and the other thing I want to tell you, just to inspire you a little bit more about being good with your typography, is that greatness is a mental construct. Everybody gets to the end result, being an expert or anything like that, step by step, right? You can't skip steps. I should have had a ladder, not a stairway, because you can skip steps. But you can't really skip rungs on the ladder, OK? So greatness is a mental construct. Everybody, you write a book one word at a time. You know, you set your type one word at a time. Same idea. So a little review. Type is everywhere, principle number one. Principle number two, good typography is economical. Principle number three, good typography makes a difference. That's what you want. A memorable set of typography is what you want. Do that. And the sky's the limit. Thank you. Let's do, uh, yeah, let's do questions.
instance, in the context of like a book where you're going to set it once and yeah. it forever, a lot yeah. of us work on the web yeah. where we have to put text that we don't know connect with other database somewhere, maybe a yeah. user, so we have to like, what, what are your recommendations for setting text Yeah, I mean, do the best you can. Of course, I mean, I, I, um, I guess I didn't mention, but I have this book. It's called Explorations in Typography. Uh, also a website here. It's on there, explorationsintypography.com. And it, it does teach you about typesetting. And you can go on there and play with your type. And you can actually set your type badly right on my own website. Um, because, yeah, it is, it, the, the web is just such a changeable medium. So it is a little different, you know. And I don't have any solutions for that. But... You know, I think as time goes by, you know, things have gotten so much better even in the last, whatever, few years, you know, just like CSS and things like that have gotten so much better, you know, allowing so much more control. So I think things will just continue to get more and more like, you know, the screen will become more and more like paper, right? So you're going to have those kind of controls eventually. When, when the technology people understand how important it is to have good typography, then they're going to design the, you know, they're going to do that engineering, you know, they're going to give us that because they, they should. Technology people, Yelp, hello, technology? Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, this might be too far to get into like off the spot, but is there a certain website that you think that you feel like you can show us and we'll do like models that you can't get to sell on the web or that you can do that? Uh-huh. Um, well, one site that I like that has really nice, um, my, my site got onto it one day as the site of the day was the AWWW Awards site. You know, that's three W's in it. Um, they have some really nice sites on there, um, and they do some interesting things with some some of the functionality. You know the way that the the um, the technology is is working is really cool. Sometimes it's kind of cutting edge. If you use someone's type and a logo, uh -huh. how do you give them credit, and do you have to like, somehow pay them? <laughs> um, well, theoretically, you would have bought the typeface, right? And then with, <laughs> yeah, I know people have people have a lot of free types on their on their computer. But if you if you buy a typeface, it comes with a document. Usually, it's a PDF. It says EULA. That stands End User License Agreement. So you have to read that. It's a bunch of legalese, right? But it and hopefully some some of them are, you know, legible enough that you can actually understand what it says. But I think typically, if it's a logo, um, there might be special cases. You might have to yeah, you might have to pay extra to whoever you bought it from. I don't know. But it really just depends on what that, that legal agreement says. And you, you may or may not have it if you actually got the font by bootlegging, you know. So you have to look that up. Yes? What if a person who is responsible Well, you know what? I think all the same principles apply. But as I was mentioning before, on the web, you just don't have the same controls as something that's printed once on a piece of paper and it's never going to change. Um, so. But like I say, I, I think eventually screens, you know, with higher resolutions, right, the retina displays and things like that, like everything is moving closer and closer to being like paper. And so it will just, eventually we will have those kind of controls. Some of them, you know, it's just not, it's not there yet. You know, they just don't have it. But these guys can do it. They're smart. You know, come on, engineers. What's your favorite font and why? <laughs> That's like asking what's your favorite child, right? You can't say that. I can't say that. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know what, my favorite font is the one that's right for the job, right? Because, you, I mean, it really is a matter of, of choosing a font that is appropriate. You don't want to choose a font just based on like, hey, I like it, it's cool. You know, like you want to pick a font for those reasons that are, you know, fitness, firmness, and delight, right? I, I'm looking for those qualities for whatever situation I'm, I'm picking the font for. And by the way, typeface selection, don't let anybody tell you that it doesn't matter. Like, oh, just use any old font, doesn't matter, you know, or... I think typeface selection is a huge part of what you need to do as a good typography, typesetter, you know, designer. I think that's really, really a big deal. Go ahead. How do you think about color um, Well, I could do a whole evening, <laughs> a longer talk about color and typography. But the main thing to be aware of about color and typography is that you want to have a good contrast between the letters and the background. So whatever two colors they are, they should have high contrast. And the smaller the type, the higher the tonal contrast needs to be. So that's why most small type, like if you're reading a novel, it's usually black type on white, right? It's the highest possible contrast. So the smaller the type, the higher the contrast. When you have huge type, like this is pretty big, so actually it's kind of low contrast there. You know, it's white on top of another kind of light gray there. But you can still see it because it's huge. 
So the larger the type, the lower the contrast can be, and you can still see it. So that's the main thing to understand. The other one is if any, even if type is large, uh, they did this in the psychedelic posters, you know, the Haight-Ashbury posters. They purposefully used two colors that were the same value, right? So they call that vibrating colors. They made the letters in the background the same. So when you look at it, you're kind of like, ooh, psychedelic, you know? So that's what the effect you're going to get. Now, you can go for that, you know? <laughs> you might like that. But typically, that's not legible. You know, you can't really see that very well when two colors are the same value. But color, you know, to everyone who uses typography and color well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, OK? Color and typography are the worst things that people use, OK? If you're not sure about color, Make it black and white and red or something. You know, you just use black and white plus one other color. Keep it simple, you know? It's, again, you can be economical with color, too. So color can really ruin things. You know, same thing with picking the wrong type. typeface can really ruin something, you know? Every designer has it, but what's your biggest pet peeve? <laughs> um, OK, my biggest pet peeve, and it's not exactly typography. And I've tweeted about this. I don't know if anybody follows me. But I, when I go to presentations, whether it's design, everybody has a bad slideshow, right? Like, great designers, bad slideshow. What's going on? Why? Why, why, why? Why don't they design their slideshow? Um, so I don't, I don't quite understand. And, and some of you might think that I have a bad slideshow. I don't know. But in fact, uh, one of the things that happened in the, in the process of uh, working this out to come here tonight is that Joe asked me to show him a slideshow that I had. And I put it up on SlideShare for Joe to see. <laughs> and SlideShare chose it as the best slideshow of the day and like featured it on their website the next day. And I had like 1,500 views. <laughs> so SlideShare thinks I had a good slideshow, I guess. Anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's, I, that's what comes to mind as being my biggest pet peeve is like badly designed slideshow. You know, design your slideshow. It's a show. Remember, also, it's a show, OK? So people trying to look at something. Don't make something ugly and something boring to look at, you know? Well, OK, so here's what happened, is that this typeface is actually a typeface that I use for my brand, which is called 101 Editions, for, that I used to publish my book. Um, so I chose that really just because it was already chosen like for the brand. But you know that typeface is just like a nice, I thought it was like a nice looking contemporary sans serif that has a little bit of a tech edge to it. You know, It's called Type Star, FF Type Star. OK, I have uh, time for one more. OK, one more. And you want to combine that with uh, one or more other types on the page. Um, is there anything you can say um, for reducing the number of typefaces you have? Would you recommend using the same typeface in the headers of the page as in the logo? Or it's possible. Um, don't do that. Uh, it's possible. There are There is a school of thought. You know, I think it's a, an older school of thought, my personal opinion. Um, that says whatever typeface is used for the brand, for the logo, that you should not use that in the, in the copy, you know, when you're setting type. Um, however, uh, for example, Apple uses Myriad, and that's it. They only use Myriad, everything, you know, the, everything's written in Myriad, you know, they, they don't have any other type. So, um, you know, that, that kind of con contrasts with that idea of, like, not using the same typeface. So you could definitely reuse the same type, and you could combine it with another type. But again, you probably want to do that exactly the same or decisively different. So you can use all that same type. Or if you're going to pick a second typeface, then you want to pick a decisively different typeface. So that's why typically we would combine a sans and a serif together, and not like two sans serif typefaces or two serif typefaces. Um, there's a page on my website. It's one of the most popular pages. It's the type combinations page. Um, people are always looking for good type combinations. So you can check that, too, for the ones that I used in the book. Um, and again, it's one of those things where while those type combinations that are listed on that page are specifically what I used, you can use it kind of as a reference. You know, like, oh, well, I'm picking something that's kind of similar to Din, and let's see what she picked to go with Din, you know, like that. So you can kind of use it as a little bit of a reference that way, too. Well, it's on the explorationsintypography.com site, but it's just the, called the Type Combos page. So if you go to that site, then you'll just click the the link to the type combos.
Also, if you Google type combinations, I think it's one of the first hits that comes up, actually. So <laughs> um, it's one of the most popular pages, as I mentioned. Nice. Great. Well, big thank you for Carolina. So.